I'm Gary Stearman. Mm -hmm. To my right, Randall Price. I should say Dr. Randall Price. He is a, uh, he's more than a student of the Bible. He's devoted his life to the Bible, and he's been taught by some great men, some great theologians, and I have great respect for anyone who can go to the top of Mount Ararat. Let's, because having, <laughs> having seen the movie, and, and the hardship uh, that you have to go through, the physical training, the, the willpower that it would take to pull that off, uh, it, to me, speaks of real dedication. Or, and, or craziness. Or craziness. I did, it six, I did it six times, not one time. So <laughs> never learned. Oh, and so, wow, what a story. <clears throat> and Dr. Ken Johnson, who I don't think you've ever been to the top of Mount Ararat, right? No, and I don't intend to. <laughs> 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 and Ken Johnson, uh, many of you know him from uh, the many books that we carry at uh, Prophecy Watchers, and uh, he's a true scholar in my opinion. <clears throat> Tell him about your interests. What, uh, what really pulls you into Bible study? Well, it all started with uh, wanting to know truth and all the different denominations we have. So I wanted to study the early church fathers, those that were disciples of the apostles. And then that got me into what they taught about prophecy and other things. And prophecy and ancient scrolls, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, things like that are where, where my heart's at. Now, we uh, ordinarily at, at these Q&A sessions field questions no matter where they come from, some off-the-wall questions, some political questions, uh, prophecy questions. But I think uh, the questions that we should deal with today uh, it should involve, uh, I think, for example, uh, Randall's interest is, is biblical archaeology, and he's a real expert on what's happening right now, where things might go in the Middle East in terms of, of uh, discoveries, in terms of developments, maybe politics connected with archaeology. He's really an expert in those fields, so if you've got questions along those lines, please you know, conjure them up in the moments to come. Uh, and, and be ready to, uh, to uh, stand and present your question. On the other hand, Ken Johnson uh, digs deeply into Scripture when it comes to Bible prophecy. He really, if you want to know uh, the fine nuances of Bible prophecy, you might feel, uh, have him field a few of that type of question. And I'm going to begin by uh, letting Randall Price tell us uh, about his interest in biblical archaeology what you're doing now, what's happening in Jerusalem with the Temple Mount, et cetera. Well, my first interest in archaeology came when I went to seminary and realized that there is all this evidence and all of this material culture that supports the Bible. You know, we read it as a story, but it's more than a story. It's his story, as we know. And uh, many of us don't think because we come by faith and say, well, I believe, so I really don't need all that evidence. But we have a, a world of skeptics who do not uh, believe because they don't have the evidence or don't think the evidence exists. And I uh, began to see the importance of apologetics, of, of defending the faith, not in the sense of apologizing for it, but at advancing uh, the knowledge of the faith because the faith is built on facts. And when I finished seminary, I said, look, I'm going to be talking about a place the rest of my life I've never seen. And, and I just couldn't do that. So my family and I picked up and moved to Jerusalem. And I started uh, studies at the Hebrew University, and a lot of those were in the area of archaeology. So our classroom there is not in walls, it's, it's outside the walls, and you meet at this location or that location, and the archaeologist meets with you and tells you what things are about. And of course, it kind of gets in your blood after a while. And now, 35 years later, having worked in that field, I spent 10 years at Qumran uh, directing the excavations there and uh, also feel the Dead Sea Scrolls are eminently important for uh, the work we do both on the Old and New Testament. But uh, started to see just how important it is to be able to unearth facts. i just give you an example. Uh, about two weeks ago, I was at a place called Kirbet Kayefa. Uh, that is biblical Shemaraim. It's a term that means two gates because it's a city with two gates, and it's mentioned in the Bible. It's on the outskirts of the boundaries of ancient Judah, and it can be reliably dated to the 10th century BC. Why is that important? Well, because we have skeptics, particularly the minimalists in the area of archaeology, 
who argue that there was no David and no Solomon. These are figments of imagination or campfire tales that got exaggerated. There was no kingdom of an imperial sense that we read about in the Bible, no first temple, none of these things. Um, Israel Finkelstein from the University of Tel Aviv and others like him have kind of put out popular books on this that tell people these were all invented stories from a thousand years later, uh, trying to create a nationalistic history for the Jewish people, which they never had. And so in the process of doing that, they, of course, include details and dates and structures, but they never really existed. It's just fabrications. Well, if there was no David and Solomon and First Temple and all of this, uh, so much of our faith is built on events that God did with them and in those places. Uh, if, it's, if it's not true, then why should we believe it? But a place like Kirbet Kiefa uh, is from David's kingdom. There's a palace there. It certainly could be an administrative building that David would have either visited or certainly under his administration. Uh, there is a ritual area there. Uh, which had, uh, this was before the temple, and they're too far away for the tabernacle. So they have these little shrines, boxes, but the architecture on them looks exactly like the same type of facade that was used for the temple. It has like the Boaz and, uh, uh, was it, uh, Yaquin and Boaz, the two uh, pillars on these boxes, and then a lot of ornamentation. Uh, so these were used by people to have a focal point of worship of the one true God uh, in a place far removed from where there would be a center of worship where the tabernacle was. There's also an archive. Uh, they found three inscriptions there, one with a name only mentioned in the Bible, uh, and now in this inscription from the time, clearly, of David. Uh, they found store grains, in this case they were olive pits, and because they'd been burned, uh, they could date these things through carbon dating, clearly the 10th century BC. So now we have this fortified city on the outskirts of Judah with a scribal activity for an archive. We have the uh, basically a cultic area, not in the wrong sense of cult, but the right sense of a sacred area, and a palace for administration. If you have all this in a little like a dinky city out here, okay? I mean, think of, um, I don't know what small cities are related to Denver or Colorado Springs, but just one of these outlying cities, you know, you wouldn't expect to see too much there. But if it's part of an empire, you would have the same things reflected there. So while we can't dig and find these things in Jerusalem because they're covered with houses and many other things, uh, or the archaeology just hasn't taken place yet, you go to a place like this and you can say, look, in the time of David and the time of Solomon, you had all these things. And if it's in this little place, what must it be in the capital city? So that we extrapolate from one to the other. And only archaeology can do that. The only new information coming to us about the Bible comes from archaeology. Now, it's not changing the Bible. It's affirming the Bible. It's confirming the Bible. It's giving uh, new information to help us understand the Bible. Uh, for instance, just those shrines that they found, it's very difficult to understand some of the language about the construction of the first temple. Uh, I was called a number of months ago by some people down in Seguin, Texas, of all places, and they said, our church is going to build a life-size model of Solomon's temple. We know how to do it. And I have a book that's got, and they found my book. And I said, listen, there's, there's some problems here because we don't understand the meaning of certain terms that are used there. Well, they didn't bother them too much because, you know, God told them to do it, so they're going to do it. Uh, but this shrine, because of the way uh, they, the, some of the architecture elements in there, they now know there was a choice of terms for a particular Hebrew word, and they know now which one it should be. So archaeological discovery adds those kind of things and helps. Um, for instance, I'm going back to Qumran this December, January, to excavate a cave to the south of Qumran. Uh, you think about this cave, uh, from the entrance of the cave, you can see the entire Qumran Plateau. And this is where these, uh, this priestly community, as I interpret it, was that left to us the Dead Sea Scrolls. They didn't write them. They wrote sectarian literature, which is very important, but they, they preserved copies of the Bible, the oldest we have, and copied those and, and preserved them. Um, and this cave down from there, 
uh, has two wings that have never been excavated, uh, very interesting. It's got two columns that are man-made in the front of the cave. Well, my head's kind of spinning because I'm saying, you know, it's a very interesting place. We could possibly find new uh, fragments of scrolls there. It's a possibility. Uh, but these two columns, we, we have a document called the Copper Scrolls found in Cave 3 in 1953. Uh, on the last day of the cleanup of the excavation, and a little skinny Frenchman who I met one day, he, he, he came and put his hand cleaning behind this rock and felt something, and they moved this big rock. There were two copper scrolls uh, put into a niche. When they finally were able to cut these things and, and stretch them out and read them, it was a treasure map, 66 places throughout the desert where, where there was immense amount of gold and silver and priestly vestments and all kind of stuff, immense treasure. Now, we don't know if it was discovered in the past and dug up. We don't know if it's still there. But most of the people who have studied this say this is not a figment of imagination. I mean, no one takes a, a very important metal like copper and engraves the letters in there and then hides it away. You know, it's like, like a joke for someone, you know, 2,000 years later discovered. No, that wasn't it. Uh, this, this was something they were trying to keep. The, but we don't know where these sites are because they, they're lost to us. But the last line of the copper scroll says there's another scroll that gives the explanation for this scroll, and it's hidden in the cave of the columns. Mm -hmm. Okay, now there are people, you've heard of Vendel Jones and others, they, they uh, are not archaeologists, but he dug in what he called the Cave of the Columns. It was a natural column cave, and they dug that to bedrock several times, actually, because if you went over with them and paid your money, you had to do something. So. Anyway, but this is a one that has, has man-made columns, okay, from antiquity. And I think what stands out in someone's mind is not an, is many of many uh, natural column caves, but this would be one that kind of you know the cave of the columns. Who knows? But I'm just saying, understanding the literature and then having the opportunity to dig, we don't know what we'll find. We may find nothing, but we could find everything. So that's the that's the thrill of it for me, and I hope you understand. Well, some of it, it is a thrill. You know, everybody that goes out with a uh, with a pick and a spade and and comes back with dirt on their clothes wants to call themselves Indiana Jones, and uh, this guy, in my opinion, outranks Indiana Jones, and uh, because he's really doing what the fictional Indiana Jones pretends to do, and. Furthermore, and having heard him talk, the thing that really thrills me is that he's doing it in the, in the name of Jesus. He's confirming the scriptures. That's the motivating factor for me. I mean, there's, I was a pastor for 30 years, and I realized that, you, you know, you're not writing to the scholars. You're writing to people. That's, that's who you're trying to reach. And so you try to take the best of this uh, academic information and distill it down where we can all understand and enjoy it. So, now, let's talk with uh, Ken our uh, the man who has promised never to try to ascend Mount Ararat. <laughs> but what Ken does is he, he digs into, the, into, part, into places in scripture and historical documents that most of us never reach. And I may put you on the spot with this question, but since this is a prophecy conference, what most interests you in the scriptures that you have recently studied about Bible prophecy? Have you discovered something that really has you excited? Uh, yeah, just the, the whole idea going back again to church fathers that say that they were, uh, that they studied under the apostles or their fathers or some relatives studied under the apostles. And the fact that they would uh, write these things. We've got people that become uh, um, well known in the Roman Catholic era, in the Eastern Orthodox era, and uh, these people all teach the same basic uh, prophecy outline. You know, that we are premillennial. There's an upcoming tribulation period. Uh, that's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 years after Jesus' first coming. They all taught these things consistently. And it's amazing. And most of that just um, tells cool. us that what we believe is, is true, and it's always been taught that way. But then sometimes they'll come up with extra information. They'll begin to identify some of the ten nations. They'll begin to identify what they think the birthplace of the Antichrist will be and what we should be watching for and these type of things. And that's just very exciting because that's, that's starting with scripture and affirming scripture and then going beyond it a little bit. And of course, scrolls can be messed up. They can be tampered with, so they should be taken with a grain of salt. But those things are just fascinating. So uh, our studies today and our interests today are not necessarily new. They've, they've occurred throughout uh, this, the church age. 
Exactly, yeah. And then that's, that's where my heart is. He's going out and digging up new things, which are really, really old things. And I'm going back with people that have taught things before, just checking all the scrolls. I have allergies. He does not. He belongs outside. I belong inside. So I just want to piece all these things together. Interior and exterior archaeology. There you go. Uh, you might be thinking of questions that you want to forward to either of these two gentlemen. Um, What's the most exciting thing going right now in, in is archaeology in Israel, Randall? Uh, when you think about things that are being done that might be of interest to a Christian who's interested in Bible prophecy, what do you think of? For example, one of the things that just really excites me, we went to Israel and, and we walked on the street where it was covered with stones that were tossed off the Temple Mount onto the ground by the Roman soldiers. And there is a rep reproduction there of a stone that fell with an inscription on it to the place of the trumpeting, where, where the trumpet used to be blown. Well, when I stood by that and I looked up at the corner where it must have fallen from, that raised the hair on the back of my neck. I was just excited about that. It just validates the living reality of Jerusalem. What, what do you see that excites you well, like that? I mean, that, just what you're telling me is excited. I was with the archaeologist who was involved, not with that excavation that was under Benjamin Bazaar, but uh, Ronnie Reich, who excavated from 1993 to 1998 for Jerusalem's 3,000th anniversary. And so they were clearing this area, which was a Herodian street um, with shops and all of this, along the extension of the Western Wall. If you've been to Israel, you see the famous Wailing Wall. This is the continuation of it to the south. And uh, when they excavated and found these stones all pushed down, uh, just piles and piles of stones, normally you would clean that area up, take it off the street you're trying to reveal. But they left those stones purposely there to remind people of the historical fact that God brought the temple down through the Romans. It was an actual fact. It happened. Um, we know, for instance, from history that the first temple was destroyed on the ninth of the Hebrew month of Av, and the second temple was destroyed on the ninth of the Hebrew month of Av. And there's other things in Israel's history, uh, Betar and um, Gamla and all these other things fell on the same time. So they don't say that as coincidence. They say God was involved. He orchestrated this. So it's clearly was done in God's time. Well, when you see that pile of stones, you have to ask the question, what are they there for? Who, who caused the destruction of the temple? And I was in a class, I remember, at Hebrew University, and we had an Orthodox professor, Isaiah Gaffney, and he was talking. And we were students going through all these issues because we know from Josephus the Romans didn't intend to destroy the temple. They wanted to preserve it and use that as a basis for when uh, they had the Jews under control, gradually giving them that uh, back. It was a very well-known building, a very elegant building. That weren't, they weren't in the job of demolition. But it, it nevertheless happened. They think soldiers got upset for the long uh, siege that they'd had, or some of the curtains caught on fire and the rocks, which are made of limestone, when that's heated up, it goes like popcorn, just uh, pops. And so it just got out of control. Uh, and so, so students said, what is the real answer? Why did this happen? And he said, I don't know, maybe Jesus was right. Now, that he was saying that flippantly. Okay, hmm. to say who really knows. But they, he was right. I mean, why are those stones there? They're there because Jesus said not one stone would be left upon another. It would not be thrown down. And uh, there would be a destruction of the city and your children within you because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Now, let me ask a quick question because it fits right in here. A lot of people are saying, well, that Jesus' prophecy was not fulfilled because there are still stones up there. There's still a big platform and so forth. Hmm. And, and so not all the stones fell as Jesus predicted that they would. How do you answer that? Well, we look carefully at the biblical text. I mean, I don't know would agree. When we read the text, we read what the text says, not what we think it says. We've had to be very careful to interpret it. And those, uh, the gospel of accounts, uh, Matthew chapter 24, 1 and 2, Mark 13, 1 and 2, uh, that talk about Jesus and disciples leaving the temple area. Uh, Jesus didn't grow up in Jerusalem. He grew up in the Galilee. And so when he made... Uh, you know, three times a year he would have to come to the temple as a, a religious Jew. 
But uh, this is one of those occasions now in his uh, adult life where he has his disciples and they come to Jerusalem. And they, those who are locals are showing him the improvements because we know it tells us the temple was in construction for 76 years after it was dedicated. They were still up to the time the temple was destroyed. They were still building on parts of it. And so um, they're pointing out these buildings. And it says, show them the buildings, okay? And then Jesus says, you see these things. He means the buildings. He said, I'll tell you, not one stone of these will be left upon another. And uh, the buildings he's talking about are the temple, the temple proper, uh, the, the, some of the courts around the temple, which were there. And it's, it's true. There's not one stone of that left. A lot of that was not only uh, torn down, but it was reused. Some of it was shipped overseas. We know that there's parts of the, the temple that got taken to Rome. We know there's parts of the temple that were used to build the Nea church in Jerusalem itself. We know there's uh, you know stones that are, why reinvent the wheel? You've got a nice quarried stone. It's beautiful, ornate. Take it with you. And so they don't, just didn't, it doesn't exist. We know that the Romans in the second century built the Temple of Jupiter right on top of that spot. So, uh, they, you know, they would have removed even more. And when the Jewish revolt took place, the second one, uh, we have Hadrian commanding his general, Tenius Rufus, to plow the Temple Mountain under with salt. And he doesn't mean the entire area. It means the place where the temple stood. So we shouldn't expect to find those, just as Jesus said. But the other things, the retaining walls, the foundation stones, these are not buildings, okay? They may be structures, but they're not buildings. And the fact is, they're there, okay? We have stones that are four to 600 tons forming some of those foundation stones in the foundation. And those walls, for the most part, still exist. By contrast, and this is something interesting because uh, Robert Cornuke and some others have made the point that perhaps a Roman fort uh, of 36 acres occupied the top of the Temple Mount rather than the small uh, area that uh, many scholars will say. I have to point out that Josephus tells us the Romans destroyed the entire Antonia Fortress and dug up its foundations in seven days. So that would be pretty difficult to do if it was that large a structure. And the fact is the Roman forts he uses as a model come from the second century AD and later. They didn't work the model that was used by Herod in construction of this uh, fort. Fascinating. I could listen to Randall talk for hours. Uh, I, I'm going to go back to Ken for a minute. And, and I want to ask Ken, what is the most exciting thing you're working on currently in terms of uh, development uh, of uh, your understanding. When, when you and I talked, we talked uh, at one point about um, a prophecy that, that actually laid out dates coming up to the present time, you know, and which are not, the prophecies are not recognized normally, and you've, you've even made a DVD about it, uh, about mm -hmm. prophecies that, that aren't commonly spoken of, that, that bring us up into the 20th century. Let's talk about some of those things you've found. Yeah, um, we're always taught to not try to set a date for the rapture and the second coming, and people take that and think, okay, we're not supposed to set dates. And really, that's the exception to the rule. We have all the way through scriptures dates that are set. In Exodus chapter 12, it says that they, the exodus occurred on the self same day the, the, when the prophecy was up for the 430 years to the day uh, when uh, Elijah was taken up. All of his disciples knew that, ah, it's supposed to be tomorrow, it's supposed to be today. You know, don't you know that he's supposed to go up today? And we don't know what date that was, or at least I don't, but they knew the date. And so these things are consistent. We know from Daniel chapter 9 that if you count the, uh, the days on the calendar and convert it properly, that you'd find out the date of the first coming of the Messiah when he's supposed to be cut off. So between the Passover Seder, you know it was going to be Nisan 14 at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and Daniel 9 gives you the exact year. So you know the exact day, month, year, hour of the Messiah's first coming and what he's going to, what he's going to do. And it, they're kind of encoded in Daniel, but you take the same basic calendar structure and you go forward, and <coughs> Israel was supposed to come back on May 14, 1948, and they did by decree. Uh, they were supposed to take back the Temple Mount, but for some reason not build a temple. And that was supposed to take place on June 7th, 1967, and it did. 
And so there's there's several things like that, and I don't try to I don't want to try to speculate on future things, but that's just amazing because somebody could go back and say, well, you know, 32, 40, 50 A.D. That's so far back. Who knows? <laughs> You can look up any newspaper and, and any book in any library about 1948 and 1967. So those are very, very important things for us to know in the idea of, of preaching the gospel, showing Bible prophecy. They came back by decree. They came back on the date they were supposed to by a guy named after King David. Uh, it just goes on and on. They re reinstituted the Hebrew language that had been basically dead as a spoken language for centuries. That's never happened before. It just goes on and on and on, and it's important for us to see that. One or two or three of these things could be a coincidence, except maybe a date. But uh, when you got 30, 40, 50 prophecies in the last 70 years, I, I mean, that, that's so faith building. How do you ignore that amount of evidence? And it's just important for us to know those things and use that to, prof uh, to uh, preach the gospel. Now, does anybody have a burning question out there? And, and if so, just stand up and make yourself known in a loud voice. Hi, you do. Okay, this gentleman and then you. Uh, my name is Roger Jones. Um, along the lines of Daniel 9 and the 70 weeks, um, and you mentioned the early church father's writings, it's my understanding that Sir Isaac Newton suggested that the missing seven sets of weeks of Daniel 9 would point to his second coming. We know that it began, the first one began when man was to take Jerusalem. And uh, some people have suggested that from June 7, 1967, 49 years, the 360 calendar pointed to last September 23rd, the Day of Atonement, when the Pope came. My simple question is do you find that valid, invalid? Do you have any opinion on it? Uh, me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, that's yours. Okay. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, I, actually, it, it's really interesting because if you look at Sir Robert Anderson's work, and he did the, the prophecy of the 70 weeks and tried to convert it to the calendar of his time, if you go further back in, in church history, there was a guy in church history that wrote a, a book called On the Prophecy of Weeks, and he told how to convert the dates on their calendar, their ancient Roman calendar. So Sir Robert Anderson got it from one of the church fathers who got it from one of the disciples of the apostles. So you can see it tracing back, and it's the same basic math, the same basic calendar structure. Uh, going forward, though, there are a lot of people, and I mean a lot of people, that understand this, that look at the dates, that know this is correct, and then try to guess on future dates, not just the, the rapture or the second coming, but other things. And you know, when someone says, thus says the Lord, they're a false prophet, that's, we're done, okay? But for all those of us that say, well, you know, if this is true, I wonder what would happen about, and we speculate, it's okay to speculate. But there are people like Sir Robert Anderson, even Isaac Newton, you know, Isaac Newton used some of those calculations and said the second coming should be 2060. You know, and I hope he's very much wrong on this side. <laughs> but um, he's in the ballpark. I mean, this is this is somebody back in the 1600s going. No, it's going to be at least 400 years from now, if not, you know, further out. But there are a lot of people through the ages and a lot of early church fathers that have speculated on that. But they've all been, um, how do I say this? Uh, knowledgeable by scripture, wanting to know for sure what has happened, and then speculate on the future. None take the, the cultic route and, and set a date for the second coming. So as far as like the, the extrapolations on that, it was a guess. Uh, there might be something to it we might want to look at. Maybe it's not even the second coming of the rapture, but maybe something would happen on those dates. We all know the stuff about like the blood moons and uh, Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, and things like that. Uh, so those are things outside of scriptures, but when you look at them, it's obvious a pattern. And those kind of patterns have to be designed by somebody more powerful than us. So it's, it's pretty obvious we need to just keep studying. Well said, Ken. Uh, the young lady here. Well, I had a question about the 70 shepherds, but I wanted to give the question to my sister because oh, no, she wanted to ask Randall a question about, Ar about Noah's Ark. Oh, okay. Kotep, uh, how do we say it right? Uh, Kotep? Gobekli Tepe. Gobekli Tepe. Yep. What is your opinion on that in the sense it's been suggested that that might have been the first village built when huh? Noah's Ark? 
You must know. Yeah, it, if not a village, certainly the, the first worship site. And Gobekli Tepe is a, it's a site that was excavated in a village near Shanli Urfa in southeastern Turkey. It um, is very strange. I mean, there's monoliths, uh, just monoliths all over the place in circles. They call it like an ancient Stonehenge. But this, they're dating it 12,000 years ago. And I don't think the world's that old, but and that's my you know, creationist belief. But it's, it's at the very beginning. And what's interesting in this site, it's, it's clearly a worship site, and it was buried, intentionally buried. I mean, you have all these standing uh, monoliths, uh, and yet it was all covered over and left intact like mm. that. May I ask a question? Yeah. How, how do you know that it was intentionally buried rather than some, something just coming in and, and covering because it? Because it's, it's not a natural fill. What okay. they, they filled it in, they, they brought back fill and they put it in. You would have knocked things over. I mean, if, it, if it just happened by the process of erosion or something else, it wouldn't be standing intact uh, as it is. And some of these are smaller and some are larger, but they're, they're all there. And I'm reading, of course, the, the report from the archaeologists, so that's what they're telling me. But here's the fascinating thing. Most all of these uh, standing stones, these big, uh, large monolithic stones, have animals carved in them, lots of animals. Some of them are animals that we don't even have around today, but it's just, you know, there's menagerie of animals in there. And then there's uh, hands raised up like this, as though they were priests in some way, you know, uh, praising God or giving a bit of, or who knows what it would be. Now, this is right in the area. It's not that far from Mount Ararat. Okay? It's just down ways, maybe 200 miles uh, from Mount Ararat. Um, and if you're coming this way and you're beginning, you know, people are beginning to develop from the eight people and things are growing, uh, they have keenly in mind all these animals that have been released now and are everywhere around them, and they want to worship God, and this is, he preserved the animals, he preserved the people. Noah got off the ark, he immediately built an altar and, uh, and uh, gave thanks to God. Uh, and then there's a covenant made with, with the rainbows, the sign of it, that God, as a warrior, will no longer destroy the earth in this way. And so his bow in the clouds represents that. And so uh, this is a worship site, uh, just kind of plain and simple. And it's in the right geographical area. It's early enough that it has to be very shortly after we begin human civilization again. And it's focused on the very elements that are related to you know, the ark with all the animals and, and things. So it's just fascinating. People are still studying it. Uh, that's a conclusion that's been drawn. Um, I've got a handbook on biblical archaeology coming out this fall with Zonderman, and I've written about this in that book. It's how I happen to know a little bit about it because I've had to read up on it. But it's a very fascinating site and uh, thrilling to a lot of people who are trying to connect the dots. Did you have a question? Yes, sir. We've all benefited from the years of study you've all done and greatly respected. My question was about the 70 shepherds. Yes. Hey, I'll, I'll second that. The 70 shepherds, um, we watch daily to see, we want Jesus to come. Hmm. And my husband and I are very familiar with your work. And when we heard the 70 shepherds, we thought, oh my gosh, do we have to wait until 2075? Or do we have to wait until all these shepherds come? Hmm. You know, is there a possibility that? You know, this is just speculation that the Lord would shorten the days, or I mean, I know you're so meticulous in all your study that you couldn't have possibly made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know me very well. <laughs> because we're, we're just hoping against hope, you know. So is that hard and fast? What what are, what do you think about the seventy shepherds in the timeline? Okay, yeah. Um, it's always possible that the, the scripture says the days will be shortened. It's always possible we could miscalculate things. And like I said, like, like we were talking about a while ago, we want to speculate, but we don't want to say, thus says the Lord. She's talking about a prophecy of 70 shepherds out of the book of Enoch, and it seems to indicate from the time that um, uh, Israel would return as a nation to the time of the return of the Messiah, there would be uh, so many shepherds or so many um, leaders, uh, leaders in Israel. And the thing was that the prophecy was really cryptic. It said that there would be 23 leaders in 58 circles. I think I got the numbers right. And you're thinking, what in the world does that mean? But 
the, the ancient ones were kings, and they became a king, and they stayed a king until they either abdicated or died or gave it to their son or whatever. Today we have political people that take an office, go away, maybe come back later, run again, you know. And so the prophecy seems to indicate there'd be 20, uh, 23 uh, prime ministers in a, in a period of 58 cycles, cycles of government, terms of office, something like that. And so looking at that thing, we could be about halfway through uh, the area, and that kind of fits with uh, the prophecy of uh, Micah with the seven shepherds. It's kind of interesting, too. There's going to be uh, between the second return of Israel and the second return of the Messiah, there were supposed to be eight wars between Israel and Syria where they take Syrian land, and we've had four of those. So, I mean, it, we're speculating. We're thinking, is this, you know, connected and... Uh, you know, how far does that go? And in each one of these cases, we're not talking about a number of years. I'm talking about prime ministers. And God forbid, a prime minister can get killed or assassinated five minutes after they're elected. You know, so you can't really put a number on those things. Um, there's a lot of other prophecies. There are several wars that Israel's are, uh, Israel is supposed to go through uh, before the second coming. And of course, we, we go seven years back in a pre-trib rapture and, and those type of things. But uh, everything all together, I don't think we have a whole lot of time left. I think it is, is getting short. I wouldn't necessarily say this year, and I definitely wouldn't say 500 years from now. Uh, it just seems like it's got to be relatively quick. I'd like to ask both of you a question. I have my Bible open here to Daniel 9, and verse 27, uh, concerning the Antichrist. He shall concern, confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with that uh, phrase. This is referring to uh, a man uh, called uh, the prince that shall come in the preceding uh, verse. And Daniel says, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. We were talking about that just a minute ago, the destruction of the city and the sanctuary. And the people that did it, Randall, and I'm sure you know about Vespasian and his son Titus and all the work that they did, they were the Romans. This would suggest a Roman descendant to be the, uh, the coming prince, the Antichrist. And yet there's a lot of controversy about that today, and I'd like both of you to comment on what, what you think about this coming prince. Do you want to go first or want me to? I'll let you go first. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, first I, it's been pointed out to me by people who understand the Roman world that it wasn't just simply in Rome. Uh, they had their one feet of the statue with, that we see in Daniel's vision. Uh, the final empire would be in the Middle East, where Rome had conquered. Another would be, you know, in uh, the, shall we say in this case, the uh, European arena. And since something like the United States was planted by a European entity, that United States would have that uh, kind of... Um, identification as well. So there's really then this Antichrist figure could come from a large area of people. To me, one of the more important things is, is that he comes from the Gentile world. Uh, we've had different interpreters through history want to make the Antichrist Jewish. And that's been very popular. Even the founder of the school I teach at, Jerry Falwell, uh, got in trouble for saying the Antichrist is Jewish and he's alive today. And so um, he had to defend that, and then the B'nai B'rith and the Jewish Federation others jumped on him for anti-Semitism, because all of a sudden if you're saying the Antichrist is Jewish, you know, he's the guy with the horns and whatever, so now all of a sudden Jews are put in the same boat. It's not what he meant, and I think it's a possibility that the second beast, who is considered the lieutenant of the Antichrist, could be Jewish because he acts as a prophet and he does things that are embodying some of the previous prophets. I don't know, but I do know that the Antichrist, the first beast, uh, is a Gentile, and this is still the times of the Gentiles, according to Luke chapter uh, 21 and verse 24, and uh, Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed, fulfilled. And it's interesting, Jerusalem is right now still trodden down by Gentiles, the, the Muslim uh, faction, because remember, Jerusalem was only the old city 
in that time when that's spoken of, not the, the large city we see today. So the Temple Mount in particular is what is being, is being spoken of, and that's under the control, yes, of the sovereignty of Israel, but they, have, they can't express their sovereignty there. That's why we have the conflict. Um, so it only makes sense that someone who would be the ruler of the world in the times of the Gentiles would be a Gentile. And when we go to Daniel 11, we see a lot of traits about him. Uh, when it said he won't uh, honor the God of his fathers. And in the text, the, the term, I think, refers uh, not the gods, it's more like gods of his father. It's, it's Elohim. It's plural. Uh, sometimes we translate that singular refers to the God of Israel because he's a triunity, and we see that in that expression. But here, it's, the, it's used in a pagan sense, so it's the gods of his fathers. But he doesn't regard them because he's a military figure. He's only interested in a, a, a god of fortresses, someone who could make him, uh, until Satan comes and then uh, gives him authority and works through him uh, to do certain things that, in fact, uh, are more satanic and, and then desire the worship of the world, not just as a means of controlling people because he wants that approbation. So I think a Gentile is what is spoken of here. Now, um, I'm, I'll leave it to Ken to explain more about the, the other aspects. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting when you look at it. We have the, the debate on whether he's a Jew, whether he's a Gentile, whether he's a Muslim, whether he's a Christian. Right. Uh, one of the church fathers mm -hmm. says that he will claim to be Jewish. And, of course, he'll claim to love Israel. And that makes sense. He's going to claim a lot of things. And I, I think it's one thing that's interesting. If I was to go over to a Muslim country and say, well, by descent, I'm Jewish, but I worship Allah, they probably wouldn't care. You know, and so it depends on what kind of group we're in. You could claim to be an, I'm an American, uh, but I might, I'm also Danish. You know, I might be Jewish. I might be this. I might be that. So it is, it is interesting. It does say that he is uh, the king of the north. He seems to be the one who's controlling things from the north. That's led a lot of us to believe that he might be the leader of a country north of Israel, which might be Syria. Uh, I don't know how you could be a leader of Syria and not be Muslim. But then again, in Daniel 11, it talks about the fact that when he comes, he will have his own New Agey type religion, not the God of his fathers. He worships the God of forces or fortresses and uh, does other things. He, makes, he, he worships him with uh, gold, silver, and precious stones. That would be forbidden in Islam, be forbidden in most Christian and Jewish you know, circles too. And so there's a lot of difference between that. He's going to be demonically inspired. So there's, you're, we're going to see miracles, false miracles, all sorts of things. Somehow he's going to pull all that together, though. And I think it's interesting how we're, we're looking for, even in nominal Christian circles, you're looking for the second coming of Jesus, whether that's a reincarnation or whatever, you know. And then the Muslims are looking for the Mahdi. The Jews are looking for a first coming of a Messiah, you know. The, the Hindus are looking for a Krishna, and the Buddhists are, are, are looking for another guy. I've been recently studying some Hindu uh, end time texts, which are really interesting about this guy that rises up and fixes things and is kind of interesting. It kind of all goes together. So he's going to come on the scene and say, I'm Jewish, I'm Christian, I'm Buddhist, I'm Hindu, I'm, I'm Muslim, and uh, I'm it. You know? And you guys were all slightly right, but you were all slightly wrong. Let me explain how it works. You know, and you're going to go, I don't know. But then he's going to call fire down from heaven. And he's going to do this, and he's going to do that. And you're going to say, because, you know, we'll be gone. So the other people are going to say, well, how could he do this unless he's yeah. telling the truth? I must be wrong. And he's going to pull it all together in this one world religion, one world government type situation. So I think we can get off sometimes by saying he's, he's got to be a Muslim antichrist, a Jewish antichrist. It, well, yeah, he's all of those. He's going to claim to be all of those, and yet he's really neither, none of those. You know, I like the we'll be gone part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. <laughs> that part I really like. I see Randall is searching his well-thumbed no, no, Bible just, here, just and uh, he's going to come up with, with a, a gem moment, no, no, um, momentarily. And yeah, well, it's basically it's Deuteronomy 13, but where it talks about the test of a 
of a prophet, whether he's mm -hmm. true or false. And uh, one is, of course, for a true prophet, he has to be able to do something in a near prophecy that confirms the far prophecy he's spoken of. Right. And so if he says something in the name of the Lord, it doesn't come true, don't believe him. But then it goes on to say, but, but what if he does something and it does come true? But he's not speaking according to this word. Don't believe him. Now, why is he being able to do it? It says, the Lord your God is putting you to the test to see whether you'll trust him and his word and not experiences. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the fact is that uh, God allows those things to happen, and we need to be settled in the scriptures and have our senses trained to discern good and evil. So when something like this happens, we aren't led astray. Because, Amen. you know, so that's the message that'll be for the last time, too. Uh, gentleman back here, uh, 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 or the lady behind him, uh, we haven't, yeah, yes. Uh, what do you make of the uh, drawing on the cornerstone of the Dome of the Rock? How do you think it got there, and what, how did the uh, Muslims explain that? Well, they say the same thing others do. They say it's a picture of Satan. And what it is, these stones that were taken were slabs that where they were cut, uh, the two facing pieces could be spread out and make a design. So throughout the Dome of the Rock, you have these, these marble slabs with these various figures. But this one particular one on the Dome of the Rock uh, looks like a head with horns. And, and, so, and, I, and it's been pointed out to be by Muslim guides that that's Satan. You know? mm -hmm. So they think the same thing. They also say there's a picture of Jesus inside the Dome of the Rock on the wall. I was shown it. Can't really quite make it out, but, you know, so that kind of thing. I don't, I don't want to make too much of that. Uh, I'll tell you, it's interesting. One of the, the photographers at the Dome of the Rock gave me his card. Uh, I asked him before I could get in there too often to go in there and take pictures for me. So he gave me his card. And he, it says, the Doom of the Rock. <laughs> that's the way he says it that's the way he wrote it he meant the dome of the rock he said doom of the rock and I said yes you know and wow. uh, so maybe they don't understand about uh, the Satan on the front of it but we do and we know that building certainly is for satanic purposes not for godly ones so he was carrying a prophecy and he didn't even know it <laughs> uh, this gentleman uh, if, you, if you will Gary can I ask two questions or just one that's one question. <laughs> it's, for, it's for Randall. Randall, um, obviously today um, Israel is superior in terms of technology, intelligence, and in other areas. But with your research, uh, the times that you research, in what ways were Israel superior in their um, technology or their construction or architecture? And the second, uh, I'll let you, know. <laughs> you mean in the past? Yeah, in the past, everything that you did. Well, not so much. I would say when we look at um, the great civilizations emerge in a period we call the Middle Bronze Period, and Israel emerges in the Iron Age, uh, this, uh, actually the late Bronze Age, and then comes into the Iron Age, which for most of us around 3000 BC, and then we're talking about somewhere around 1500 BC, and then we're talking about 1200s BC when they're selling in the land. And you look at the pottery of Israel, it's so plain, it's so simple, it's so unadorned. Now, that could be the fact that they don't want to do images because the Torah says not to do that. But all the cultures around them are amazingly developed cultures. They have megalithic structures. They have these wonderful ornate pottery. They even have, you know, weapons of bronze, which Israel doesn't yet have. They have to confiscate it, but they're not making their own. And then later they have iron when Israel still has bronze. They, they, they tend to be behind. Uh, and that's why God gives the constant warnings, said, you know, don't look at all these cultures and everything. I may, I'm giving you laws that make you distinct from them. Don't do what they do. Uh, because the tendency is, you know, my crops aren't doing so good. Well, my neighbor's crops are doing good. Why? He says, well, you know, Baal and the cycle of uh, fertility here. And if you just give a, a little statue in your house for Baal, you know, and, uh, you, you'll get, maybe I should do that. So that's called syncretism. You know, so I worship God, but in, on the side, just to play the, the bets, you know, I'll uh, worship this other God too. And uh, so he says, don't look at how they're prospering, what's going on with them. And I think it's the same there. As David one time said, you know, uh, um, he said, 
it's, I think Psalm 73, but I could be wrong, but it's, you know, I, he said, I looked at the prosperity of the wicked. I saw that they're fat and they're never in trouble like other men. And he said, you know, I almost lost it, you know, my, my own faith. He said, how come they have everything? He said, until I came into the sanctuary of God, and then I perceived their end. And he said, let me tell you the difference. They're going to grow up, get big, and then they're going to blow away forever. Whereas the righteous starts small and develops, but he's going to be around forever. And so that was the contrast. And I think God uh, didn't prosper Israel in that way. They had, they had God. They had spiritual prosperity. So the material prosperity didn't come. Today, I think it's a different situation. I think because of the diaspora and Jews having to, uh, they, they couldn't work in the gills and all the places they were in. They were confined. Uh, they became money lenders. That's one reason they get the reputation of being so involved with money. Uh, the other was professional uh, work, doctors, lawyers, study, uh, studies, and, and things like this would give them an edge you know, to propel them into the world they couldn't enter. And so they have a disproportionate number of intelligent people, uh, Nobel Prize winners, you know, scientists and scholars, and that's, that's the result. And they've come out from the nations uh, this intelligentsia has come and in, in, in focused in this small place, Israel, and they have per capita more of this than other people. That's why we have so many achievements and, and things coming from there. I'd like to ask Ken a question, uh, and we're coming close to the end of our time. Uh, Ken, what are you working on right now that's got you really excited? What's, what's your latest project? Uh, well, next month I'm coming out with a book on the Constitution, the Founding Fathers and the Bible, and just showing how we have and always have had inalienable rights, uh, starting from the pre-flood world and then going forward. And I just think that would help us understand that we need to stand up and be Christians and uh, explain to the government that they need to follow our direction. And if enough of us do that, that's exactly what will happen. You know, but, Amen. So I'm also interested in, in doing some work on uh, making it easy to witness to Muslims through using the Quran and things like that. Later on, I want to do some more translations of uh, some of the early church fathers' works, which I think are really helpful in understanding. And we'll be waiting for those books. Yeah. Randall, what project are you excited about? Well, a number of them. I've already mentioned the excavation at the cave in Qumran uh -huh. uh, this December, January. Uh, I didn't want to mention a time related to our next Noah's Ark expedition because it could compromise what we're doing. Let me just say it could be soon, and we're hoping for good results from that. Uh, I'm also writing a book right now with uh, Gordon Franz. I think you know Gordon. Um, yes. And the book is called Setting the Record Straight, Answering Archaeology's Curious Claims. Every time I'm in a conference like this, people ask me, well, this guy says this, and this guy says that, and, and it's, it's usually pastors or laymen and people who are very concerned about it, it, you know, wanting to get to the truth of the Bible, and so they have someone who thinks has solved the problem for them. But it's not always done in a correct and accurate way, and the problem is then, uh, you know, the result is good, but the way you got there is wrong, and we really can't advance truth by error. So uh, we're, it's almost finished. We've, we've got at least seven chapters on the Lazark, so many things out there. But we, we, we're covering the whole gambit of people who have written, fill the internet with information, uh, a lot of people you know. And we're simply trying to evaluate this so that you will have a tool when someone asks you a question about something, so well, let me look this up, and there it is in the ah, book. Curious so, claims. That's yes. kind of a delicate way to put it. Uh, you, could, you could have been more severe, right? I could. <laughs> Gordon would be. No, oh, I mean. oh, okay. <laughs> I uh, tone him down. All right. We are right down to the end. Do we have a really good closing question? Somebody out there saying, I wish, uh, I wish someone had stood up and asked this one. All right. Stand up. Okay. Please, please go, Randall. Do we, does your archaeology study support or go against uh, pre-Adamic communities? Well, I, you know, I'm an archaeologist, not a paleontologist, which normally deals with fossil man and things like that. I don't, uh, you know, I don't see in the scriptures a pre-Adamic race, you know, because the way I, when you come to the first first verses of Genesis, it says, Bereshit bara Elohim et shemaim ve'ha'aretz va'ita tohu va'bohu, and they, so it means in the beginning God created the heavens and there was void, you know, and uh, 
and emptiness. And the idea is there that some people want to see a gap in there in which uh, you have room for a pre-damic race. I've had a lot of people who are Christian evolutionists who want to use that to say here's where we had, how we fit early man in, it was there. Uh, the problems, of course, with all that is that you you don't have the fall of man or sin until later. And, yet, and that is where death comes. And if you have death before all of that, how do you explain what caused that death when the wages of sin is death? So these are some of the theological issues we have to grapple with. So, But nothing archaeologically that I know. You know, there may be people who work in more crypto-archaeological circles and would have those answers, but I've seen nothing that supports it. Okay. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, two... Uh, uh, giants in the world of uh, biblical exposition and I, I have a, a great deal of respect for Ken and for Randall and uh, pray for them by the way pray for Randall uh, I would ask you uh, because he's got uh, some projects which he mentioned a minute ago that he really can't talk about because the details uh, have to be worked out sort of behind the scenes uh, I'm sure he would uh, covet your prayers uh, that his project would go forward. And so when you think of him, then just pray. Because the things that he is looking at could be extremely important. And I will just leave it at that, unless you have something to add. No, just like Ken, we're servants of the Lord. Wherever he leads, we follow. And we try mm -hmm. to do what he compels us to do. We leave the results up to him. So, Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Lord bless you.